Welcome back to chapter 5. We're going to wrap up this video series by looking at punishment, the other variable in operant conditioning. And at the very end of this video, we'll wrap up with a few other pieces of learning. Let's come back to operant conditioning, where we said that a behavior happens first, and then that behavior is either reinforced or punished. Remember, a reinforcer is anything that increases the chance the behavior will happen again. A punisher is anything that decreases the chance the behavior will happen again. So if you are speeding down the highway, you're pulled over, and you're given a ticket, that sounds like punishment to me. In theory, that should decrease the chance you will speed again. Now just like with reinforcement, there is positive and negative punishments. And once again, they do not mean good or bad. Positive punishment is a reference to adding something so that you will stop the behavior negative punishment is taking away something so that you'll stop the behavior. Examples might be spanking for positive punishment. Again, it doesn't mean good, but positive means add. So spanking is adding pain so that you will stop doing what you're doing. Adding a fine, stop doing what you're doing. Though I suppose that could also be an example of negative punishment because negative is take something away. If you're grounded, I've taken away your privileges so that you stop what you're doing. If you get a speeding ticket, I'm taking away your money so that you will stop doing what you're doing. So you kind of, it depends on the grammar you use, but I think you get the idea. Now, if you're going to punish, there are things that we can do to make it more effective. Making punishment more effective is a matter of following certain criteria. For example, in punishment, it needs to be swift meaning the punishment needs to be as close to the behavior as possible. The longer you wait, the less effective that punishment is at altering the behavior. And instead, you just end up punishing the person. So the old adage of wait till your father gets home is not a great punishing technique. One, it makes one of the parents the villains. But also, you've waited a long time. If this behavior is something that needs to be punished, it needs to happen immediately. Secondly, punishment must be sufficient. It must meet the crime. If you punish too severely or punish too weakly, so either way, not in proportion to the behavior, it is much, much less effective. Third, punishment has to be impersonal. There can't be emotional investment. If you get even the smallest bit of pleasure at watching someone be punished, you do not need to be the one in charge of punishing that person, that kid, the adult, that animal, whatever. Right? Emotions make us punish too severely or too weakly. And finally, punishment needs to be consistent. If it's a behavior that you believe needs to be punished, it must be punished every time, not just sometimes. Even if it's inconvenient, if you've decided this is a punishable behavior, it needs to happen. And altogether, in some business and business ethic classes, I've heard this referred to as the red hot stove rule, so that's fine. It's a good little metaphor for thinking of burning your hand on the stove. It'll be swift, sufficient, and personal, and consistent every time. Now, when should you punish? Well, it turns out punishment is best served for behaviors that are immediately dangerous to someone or to, to the person who is doing the behavior or dangerous to someone else. I'll give you an example. A child running into a traffic or reaching out and they're about to touch a hot stove. Most of us will swat that kid's hand out of the way of the stove. Certainly, even if we're not a speaking uh or we're into spanking as a philosophy of discipline. But in that moment, we're worried about that child's safety or health. If a child gets into a fight or bites someone at daycare, those are punishable behaviors because those are immediately a threat to themselves or someone else. But here's where things get tricky. What if your kid doesn't clean their room when you tell them to? Is punishment the best way to get long-term behavioral changes? The answer is no. No, it's not. Reinforcement is far superior to punishment and long-term behavioral changes. Punishment's pretty good in the short term. You can immediately get a result, but don't expect a lasting result. That's because punishment doesn't unteach behavior. When you punish someone, the behavior doesn't leave their brain. Punishment suppresses behavior. So when you were a kid and you talked back to your parents and you got in trouble and sent to your room, did you stop talking bad about them? No, you just did it in your room where they couldn't hear you. Just like some of you speeders who I made reference to earlier. If you've ever been pulled over and you got a speeding ticket, 
I guarantee you still speed, you just slow down at certain areas or certain parts where you don't speed, right? Because punishment doesn't unteach behavior, it suppresses it. That behavior still exists inside. And ultimately, when we think of raising kids, for example, we believe that the end game of parenting is for that child, now an adult, to make good decisions when no one is around to judge them or punish them to just have good behavior in general. And that's why punishment fails at long-term changes. If nothing else, you have to remember that punishment is aversive, it's bad. By definition, punishment has to be bad. That's what makes it punishment. But a child or an adult consistently and repeatedly exposed to punishment, especially physical punishment, shows signs of depression, violent behavior, poor self-control, and not surprisingly, we tend to copy those punishment styles. If a kid is spanked all the time, don't be surprised if that kid hits other children. That child has picked up that physical violence as part of what you do. Uh, don't be surprised if that child hides or tries not to find you or runs away. It's, that's actually a fairly common story. Why? Because punishment's bad. If I know my boss is mad at me at work today, I'm going to do all I can to avoid my boss, to not be seen by him or her. So it's not that punishment isn't useful. It absolutely is. But there are certain criteria and certain times where punishment is most effective. But generally speaking, for long-term behavioral changes, we want positive reinforcement. Let's wrap up this talk on operant conditioning, both positive and punishment, negative punishment, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, all of those variables. We're talking about immediacy. It turns out that like with punishment, for all variables, it's better to pair those reinforcers, those punishers, those neutral stimuli with unconditioned stimuli. It's better to have those things immediate. And if you think about some of the bad habits that we have, it makes sense. For those of you who are smokers, you know it's bad for you. There, there aren't really any smokers, at least not in adult life, that don't know this is a bad and unhealthy practice. But let's think about it. The bad things, the consequences in smoking, typically don't appear for decades. But the positive benefits of smoking, that good feeling, that euphoria, you feel that immediately. It's no, not surprising that many of us have bad vices, bad behaviors that we know are bad. We know we're poor. You know, we don't exercise. We don't eat well. We drink. We smoke. We do things that we know aren't great for us. But it's not about just simply willpower. It's not just about intelligence. Realize that in a scheme of operant conditioning, you are being rewarded immediately for engaging in those behaviors. And if you are to be punished, it could be years from now. It's not a very effective way to teach something. It's not a very effective way to change behavior. And that's why we can get trapped in some of those cycles. Now I want to end by talking about applied behavioral analysis, which is a little bit more of a behavioral mod tool. For example, if you study autism, if you're interested in studying classes or taking things like we offer here at Crowder, um, applied behavioral analysis is a classic way of using operant conditioning that we've just learned to modify behavior. And it's become especially powerful tool in special needs kids, such as autism. So let's think about this. It's actually a pretty simple concept. Instead of looking at bad behavior and saying, let's punish that bad behavior and maybe they'll stop. It instead says, what is reinforcing about that bad behavior? Are they getting attention? Are they getting power? Are they getting influence? Are they getting friends? What are they getting out of this bad behavior? And instead of punishing, ask, let's remove the reinforcer. Let's get rid of that reinforcer, like in the principle of extinction. And let's bring back the reinforcer when in the, be the behavior we want them to do. And the reason why I brought up autism is because some of you are familiar with autistic kids that traditional disciplinary techniques rarely work because they have a very different, very skewed perspective and social connections as opposed to those of us who aren't autistic. It just doesn't work. So instead, we use the tools of operant conditioning, specifically reinforcement, to try to make a difference. And it works. Now, I want to wrap up this video uh, by showing an example, just like I did with uh, reinforcement. Um, that I found from TV that I thought was kind of funny. I think maybe you'll get a kick out of, but it perfectly illustrates operant conditioning. Before I play the film though, I actually want to real quick wrap up this chapter by looking at a couple of forms of learning very quickly 
that I'm not going to go into as much detail, but it is important to think about. At the beginning of this unit, we did talk a bit about observational learning, that humans have the capacity to learn through using their senses, not just through being conditioned. And Albert Bandura is one of the big names in this idea. He did one of the more famous studies about Bobo the clown. Bobo is that clown doll you see in the pictures. That could be knocked down and it bounces back up. You've probably seen similar toys. Now in his experiments, he would have children watch adults play with Bobo in different ways. Some adults would play nice, and some adults would play mean, beat him up, rough him up. And then he would turn the kids loose into the room, and that had lots of toys, and they could play with whatever they wanted to. But ine inevitably, he found what you might guess he found. Uh, he found that when the children decided to play with the Bobo, they copied what they had seen. And I don't just mean generally, such as, you know, mom and dad were beating up the clown, so they beat it up. Uh, they copy verbatim. Uh, you can see in the picture an adult woman picked up a toy hammer and hit Bobo in the face with a hammer. Uh, the kids who watched also sought out the hammer to hit Bobo in the face with a hammer. Uh, and again, it's not that it's wrong to beat up this clown. That's what the toy is for. But it's a reminder of how we can pick up information uh, even without thinking about it, but without knowing what we're learning uh, and replicate that behavior. Now, Bandura did say that there are variables that require uh, us to so, sort of we have to adhere to these before observational learning will happen. Uh, if we don't pay attention, don't expect observational learning to show up because you didn't get the data to begin with. But you also have to be able to remember it, to retain the information. Uh, if you can't recall the instructions I gave you, observational learning cannot work. Third on the list, and this is a big one, can you physically produce what you learned? And I can watch uh, major athletes in the Olympics compete, and I can remember what they did but I don't physically have a body trained or conditioned to do what they do. So therefore, I can't really learn through observation. I can't replicate that behavior on my own. Not yet. And finally, there's reinforcement, which basically is the conditioning we've already talked about. If you engage in a behavior and that behavior is reinforced, you know, you watch a show about cooking, you have all the stuff to cook, you bake a cake, and your friends love your cake, that's reinforcement. Well, there you go. If you watch a cooking show, you make a cake, your friends eat it, and they have to go to poison control, well, that's punishment, and you're less likely to replicate that behavior, and that observational learning begins to disappear. Very quick, a couple other types of learning. We've got latent learning. That just means that you learned earlier, but we saw no sign of it. Oftentimes, we have moments where we know the answer to a question or a piece of trivia, and then we immediately think, how did I know that? Well, turns out you did learn something in the past. It's up there somewhere. You just never had an excuse or reason to access that information. I mentioned the mice in a maze because some researchers have played with mice to demonstrate this point. They have one group of mice where they put cheese at the end. And those mice every day get faster and faster through the maze to get the cheese until they can run through in a flash. The second group of mice, they put in the same maze, but they never put cheese at the end. And every day, those mice just meander around the maze. They take forever to get out, and so it doesn't look like they've learned how to navigate the maze. But on the next week of trials, they put down cheese for the very first time, and all those rats in group B immediately sail through the maze, just as good as the group A. It's because they did learn. They just weren't showing it. It was there. Finally, there's insight learning, and if you know the word eureka, you know what I'm talking about. That moment where you solve a problem, you come to a conclusion that you've been stewing on, that the brain's been working on. And it's not just in humans, as you can see in the picture of these chimps and that banana, that food, all right? Uh, we can come up with a solution. We can create a problem, uh, or rather understand a problem, and create a solution to that problem almost immediately. You might imagine this is kind of hard to study because sometimes we can work for years on a thing and almost overnight our brain goes click and there it is. Now as we leave learning and before I leave you with that video of operant conditioning, let me just say that there are limitations to what we can learn. But those limitations are biological. I've heard people say, ah, oh, this subject's too hard, this math is too hard for me, I'll never learn this. I'm going to tell you now, you're wrong. Uh, you can. You have the potential to learn almost limited amounts of, it, of things. Uh, I, I guarantee you can learn that math. Uh, it may take you longer. It may take more work based on your education, your upbringing, your aptitude, your talents, but you absolutely can learn it. Unless there's an actual biological, physical impairment. And unfortunately, that can happen. 
Uh, there are boys and girls born mentally retarded with some sort of neurological damage, such as with fetal alcohol syndrome. And because of that, while those kids can learn a lot, there are going to be some limitations, and that's because of actual physical damage to the equipment. You also have to realize that no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how much you've learned in this lifetime, we are subject to our biological tendencies, our instincts. There's a phenomenon called instinctive drift, which is animals, including us, tend to revert back to more instinctual behaviors despite what we've learned. The only time I've been bit by a dog is my own dog, who, by the way, loves everybody. She is a fan of every person, including me. All she wants to do is play. So why did she bite me? Well, one day, we're out playing, and another dog came and tried to attack her. In fact, did, and she wasn't going to win that fight. So in that moment, in my desire to protect my dog, I picked her up. She bit me. Think about it. Why did she do that? She's never bit a person before. She loves all people. Well, in that moment, she was being attacked literally being bitten by another dog. And I reach out and I touched her, you know, to grab her to pick her up. And all she knows is I'm in danger, I'm being attacked. And then those hands touch me. I'm being attacked again. And so she instinctively lashes out. Okay? Never had a problem again. She's fine. I'm fine. But it reminded me of that instinctive drift. And let's be honest. We do this too as humans, right? I am, I believe, a very logical person. I don't have any superstitious or supernatural beliefs. But... This Halloween, if you put me in a cemetery after midnight, nah, I'm going to get scared. <laughs> I'm going to feel uncomfortable. I logically know there's no monster that's going to jump out and eat me, but it's going to kind of feel that way because my instincts are for self-preservation. And humans in the dark, we don't do that well. All right. Well, thanks for listening to the video. I'm going to post this uh, uh, little TV clip at the end here. And remember, this is about operant conditioning. Hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you next chapter. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. What was that? You said be nice to Penny. I believe offering chocolate to someone falls within the definition of nice. It does, but in my experience, you don't. <laughs> There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Uh, yeah, no, 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 that's you, obnoxious and insufferable. <laughs> oh, sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. What's this cartoon called again? Oshikuru Demon Samurai. And it's not a cartoon, it's anime. Anime. You know, I knew a girl in high school named Anime. Anna Mae Fletcher. She was born with one nostril. Then she had this bad nose job and basically wound up with three. <laughs> You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? I'm sorry. Zip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? Yes, please. Oh. Hey, Kim. Yeah, I... You know what? Hold on. Let me take this in the hall. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. Chocolate? No. Sheldon. You can't train my girlfriend like a lab rat. Actually, it turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. Oh, there 
There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. No. This has to stop now. I'm not suggesting we really make her jump out of a pool. I thought the bazinga was implied. I'm just tweaking her personality. It's sanding off the rough edges, if you will. No, you're not sanding Penny. Are you saying that I am forbidden from applying a harmless, scientifically valid protocol that will make our lives better? Yes. You're forbidden. Bad, Leonard. <laughs>